yes. Well, I'm not sure I really need the mask now I'm at home and with I'm you with you, Brady. So let's take this off. Where did that come from? I made it myself. Right. So it's unique. I suppose I've always felt it's quite difficult to do unique things with a periodic table. But I wanted to tell you about something else that I did which I thought was unique as well with the periodic table. What a very nice segue, Professor. <laughs> it started a long time before um, lockdown, perhaps nearly five years ago. I was playing on my computer one afternoon and decided, I can't remember why, to flip the horizontal of the periodic table using PowerPoint. So what was pointing up suddenly pointed down. And it was a sort of joke. But then when I looked at it, I was really quite surprised because the periodic table turned out to look something like this. Of course, the first time I did it, the letters weren't the right way round. I thought it was good if you thought about the periodic table like a graph, because when it's a graph, if you have the zero here, things normally increase in this direction and that one. Then the periodic table, they increase in this direction, but everything like weight and so on increases when you go downwards. So it's a bit sort of upside down. And this is really difficult when we talk to chemists, to our students, about how the electrons fill up to give you the structure of the periodic table. It's got a German name. It's called the Aufbau Principle, meaning the building up principle. Somehow it doesn't sound good to the students if you say this means building up and then you do it downwards. So I got quite excited about this and I wrote a little article about how having the periodic table the other way up might be better, certainly from the point of view of teaching. And I wrote to um, an expert on the periodic table and said, had he ever seen one like this? And he said, no. So I got really excited. Perhaps I'd done something new with the periodic table. So I sent it to the journal and the editor was quite excited. But then he said, hang on a minute. Perhaps people will read it like a book from the left to the right and starting at the top rather than the bottom where all the interesting elements like hydrogen and helium are, and they'll concentrate too much on the heavy elements at the top. So we were stuck. And then I suddenly remembered that my daughter, who's an experimental psychologist, who specialises in measuring where people look, tracking their eyes when they look at a picture. And so they could see whether I was looking at Brady or the camera or whatever. I decided I would collaborate with her. Never collaborated with my daughter before in the scientific project. So she and her colleague Alexis set up an experiment, not a very big one, with 24 subjects. So that people weren't biased, they used a blank periodic table with all the squares, but not the letters. And the results were really quite surprising. What they found was that if you look at an ordinary periodic table, you begin by looking in the middle and then your eyes go to the top where hydrogen and helium are. But with the inverted periodic table, you still begin in the middle, but your eyes go downwards to the hydrogen and helium. So we could prove to the editor that the way people looked at our periodic table was different from a book. Uh, why is that, Professor? Does, does the paper or did your daughter conclude why no matter where you put those elements, hydrogen and helium, and, you know, the, well, that's where you go? I think it's because the picture, well, the periodic table is relatively symmetrical where the lanthanides and activanides and heavy elements are. But at the bottom, or the top, depending which one you're looking at, where hydrogen and helium are, they're a bit unsymmetrical. And I think your eye is drawn to things that are unsymmetrical. And there was also a thought that perhaps the upside-down periodic table looked a bit like an animal with legs. Um, but that wasn't 
really proved one way or another. The numbers were significant, but the difference wasn't huge. But it was enough to convince us, and more importantly, the editor and the referees, <laughs> so that it was a real effect. And if you're interested, you can read all the details in the supplementary information to the paper. There was then quite a long delay because Chemistry Journal had never published a paper involving human subjects, and there was a lot of extra paperwork, but it was published, and I was really excited to have a paper with my name and Ellen's name together. Professor, be honest, because it's just you, me, and the periodic videos viewers. Was this bit of like a gimmick or a publicity stunt or what, what are you trying to achieve here? You're not seriously trying to get every periodic table on a wall and a textbook in the world flipped upside down, are you? What I wanted to do was to make people think differently about the periodic table. I am showered by people sending me different sorts of the periodic tables saying theirs is much better than the conventional one and so on. I don't think ours is any better than any other one, but for some purposes, like explaining the filling of the electron shells, could be useful. There were some quite exciting things. The New York Times and the London Times wrote little articles about it. Never had my research in the popular press before. And then it caused quite a sensation in Japan. And... A museum in Japan included a version of the periodic table in their display for the International Year of the Periodic Table. And best of all, for the closing ceremony of the International Year of the Periodic Table in Tokyo, a special fan was made. You can see it here, quite useful on a hot day, and which has our upside-down periodic table on it. But... The really important lesson for me was that you cannot really do anything very original with a periodic table. And sometime after the paper was published, somebody pointed out to me that the English theoretical chemist Christopher Longett Higgins had published a paper in 1957 when I was nine years old, not quite ten, and had never heard of the periodic table, saying perhaps it would be better to have the periodic table the other way round for teaching the Aufbau principle. In the end, I got the fun of publishing a paper, but I got quite a salutary lesson that you cannot discover anything new about the periodic table, except if you're Brady, who invented the periodic table of videos, which I think really was original. <laughs> if you've ever dreamed of having your name on the periodic table, well, I'm not sure there's much we can do to help you with that. That's a very select club, some of the great names in science. But what you can do is have your name on our periodic table of patrons, which looks like this. This is a slightly less exclusive but equally important club of people that support our project on Patreon. We update this table every month or two with names of people who've adopted elements. Patreon supporters also receive occasional exclusive extras, photos, behind the scenes stuff. If you're interested, go to patreon.com slash periodic videos or have a look at the links I've put in the video description. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll be back again soon with more stories from the periodic table. That one, not the Patreon one. <laughs>